And so we'll just go ahead and, uh, and get right to it this morning. So we have a number of things to update you on today. Um, a status of our um, long awaited modernization um, effort to our unemployment insurance benefits system. And I touched on this briefly under the December 18th press call. So we'll give you a quick update on where we stand with that project. Um, we'll provide just a very quick update on uh, where we are with the um, federal benefits extension implementation. And then certainly I think I've heard from almost most of you on the call, a quick update on fraud, what we're seeing, and most importantly, what people should know if they uh, believe they've been a victim of um, fraud, identity theft, and have um, received communication from us or a rely card in the mail. Um, and then certainly chat in your questions. I will probably wait and respond to all questions at the end. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Barella, um, Executive Director. Good morning, welcome Joe. Good morning, Chair, and good morning everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I just uh, will do a quick high level recap for you all here at the Department of Labor uh, and Employment, just specifically to the Unemployment Insurance Division. As you all know, we went from historic low to historic high unemployment in three months. February of 2020 to April uh, of 2020 saw that escalation. Uh, we were also directed by the CARES Act to implement four new programs, unemployment insurance programs. And I think all of you are aware, not only in Colorado, but throughout the country, the complex programming to administer these benefits was quite a feat uh, because of the legacy systems that most states are currently operating on. And so uh, we uh, have to, uh, it's heavily time intensive and work intensive to program these systems uh, to uh, administer benefits as they change and are responsive to the needs of the current rules and regulations that we receive from the federal government. Uh, PUA specifically uh, was the first time that we were ev ever able to offer benefits to gig or contract workers. And so that program was stood up in April and we were one of the first states to do that. Um, I hope you know that through the uh, Unemployment Insurance Division in Colorado, we have been able to put $6.7 billion of resources into the economy. And we are confident that this helped keep Colorado's employed and kept the economy that was able to remain open during the restrictions, uh, at least uh, provide services and keep people employed. Uh, nearly 1 million unemployment insurance claims have been filed since mid-March. Um, today, we have over 265 thousand Coloradans receiving unemployment insurance benefits. At the Department uh, Unemployment Insurance Division, our current priorities are modernization. Uh, this project has been in the works for many years. Uh, we will, it will bring more flexibility, agility, and cloud-based systems to the claimant side of the unemployment insurance program. Uh, we feel that modernization and technology also helps create a more secure environment, and so we'll have new tools and resources to deal with a safe uh, application process for our claimants. Uh, as you know, this week we will pull down the old system and stand up the new system this weekend. All claimants in the new system, uh, Cher will discuss more of that process and how we want to communicate uh, what we're doing and make sure that people who are relying on these benefits uh, have the most up-to-date information to continue to get those benefits. Uh, we have claimants in multiple uh, applications, and so this creates an issue as we uh, strive to make sure that people who exhaust state benefits can move on to federal benefits. But with the expiration of the CARES Act program, we do think and we do want to communicate to people there will be a lapse in benefits of federal resources uh, as we convert to the new uh, Continuing Assistance Act that was just passed um, um, at end of last year. Um, the federal benefits extension, uh, we um, have received guidance uh, from the Department of Labor. We still are waiting on complete guidance. I believe we, see, we received three of the five expected guidance uh, that we will need to uh, make sure that the program programming in the system can meet that. The new system will shorten the reprogramming timeframes. Uh, as you know, with the, the previous federal programs, uh, the FEMA program with the Lost Wages Assistance Program, uh, and even the Governor Polis' uh, stimulus program, we had to reprogram these systems to pay those benefits. We, we stood up those programs expeditiously between two and four weeks. We anticipate we'll be able to do the same thing, uh, maybe even a little sooner with the new system once we go live. Um, new system will shorten programming, so if there's any changes or any additional uh, stimulus program that comes out of the federal government, we'll be able to uh, program that system to pay those benefits more expeditiously. 
Um, we do think that with the federal uh, extension of benefits uh, with the uh, Continued Assistance Act, we will roll out those programs in phases. Most likely, um, the federal pandemic uh, unemployment compensation, which is the additional $300 a week, will be the first program we roll out once we um, have that programmed and ready to go. Uh, we're committed to ongoing uh, communications with, with our claimants to make sure that they know what they need to do or what we're doing to make sure that these benefits get into their hands as quickly as possible. Um, I think I'll talk uh, a little bit about fraud. Um, as we have reported since July, fraud within the unemployment insurance system has become rampant following the passage of the CARES Act. The PUA system or the pandemic uh, unemployment assistance is a relatively easy target as it does not have the same checks and balances inherited, inherent in the state UI system. Colorado was one of the first agencies to begin an aggressive fraud detection and prevention program when this issue uh, became apparent. Uh, we believe sheer volume of identity theft has created this issue. Um, we're well aware of data breaches that have happened over the last several years. Uh, we now know that people are purchasing that uh, identity and using that personal uh, uh, information to file claims in Colorado and every state in the country. And so we are uh, doing our best and dedicating resources to make sure that we're first of all notifying people of the potential of their identity being stolen, but also stopping payments from going into those uh, fraudulent accounts. The new system will be able to address fraud with regular UI, uh, which is something we haven't been able to do. It's only been uh, uh, implemented with the CARES Act program, and so Cher can go into that a little bit uh, in more detail. And that um, we, we know that the legacy systems we have, and even new systems, uh, once upon a time, the social security number was that guarded piece of information that we relied on to do authenticity uh, is no longer reliable. And so systems need to be resourced and built uh, with this in mind. And so we are looking at new technology that allows us to make sure that the people that are claiming unemployment or filing for unemployment insurance are actually the person that is in need of that benefit. And so we're excited that the new technology will allow us to do a better job at preventing identity or misidentity being used to fraudulently apply for unemployment insurance moving forward. I want to remind people that in Colorado, we know we're going through difficult times, but uh, if you would every day check on Connecting Colorado, um, we have about 70,000 jobs that are needing to be filled throughout the state and there is work to be done. And so as people are struggling and may not want to go back or are unable to go back to their dislocated job, we want to encourage them to use the public workforce system in Colorado and, and talk with the job coach, look at what's available in their community uh, for a potential new opportunity or a career change. And there's resources available to upskill them, reskill them, and to move them into occupations that are currently uh, really struggling to find skilled talent. And so I want to remind people we also have uh, Onward Colorado, which is an online uh, resource that's community-based that can connect uh, people that are on unemployment insurance or who, ex who have exhausted their unemployment to uh, uh, immediate needs or social uh, services in their communities. So with that, um, thank you, uh, everyone, and I'm going to turn it over to Cher. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm going to just circle back to a, a few points and some of the topics that Joe touched on. I think he covered uh, pretty much everything. Just want to go back to um, where we are with our modernization efforts. So as Joe mentioned, uh, we are entering into uh, the conversion period with the, um, with the upgrades. So what this means, as we've reported before, is that there will be no ability for a claimant to access their claim information, nor will our agents have the ability to access their claim information with the two systems during these conversion days, which will start um, this evening, and we're hoping to bring the system back up this weekend. And so we have, um, in the meantime, we're, we're deploying a number of things. Um, we will be adding staff to our third-party call center when we do bring the system back up over the weekend to handle technical questions and other claimant inquiries. Um, we'll be posting daily web, uh, website updates and alerts um, as to the progress of the upgrade um, and implementation of the new system. Again, as Joe mentioned, we, we basically have uh, two separate systems running now, 
um, APUA system, if you will, that we stood up um, during the pandemic, and then our outdated um, regular UI system. This presents a number of challenges for us. It presents a challenge with communicating to the claimant population because you're pulling data from multiple databases. It presents a challenge with reprogramming the systems. For example, during the Great Recession, we'd see up to 10 to 12 weeks to reprogram these, uh, our current system for extended benefits, um, bringing it into this new cloud-based environment um, with a modernized system will not only help us with reprogramming as needed due to federal extensions, it will help us with more streamlined communication to claimants. Mm -hmm. On the claimant side, it will create great, a greater user experience, user experience within the application. And then um, most importantly, especially where we are now with the pandemic, all claimants will live in one system. They will all have um, the same cadence with which they're requesting a benefit payment. They will all see the same functionality within the application. They will all, all have the same mechanism to receive correspondence from us. So overall, this update is um, obviously long overdue. The timing isn't ideal. We were poised to go live with this new system in April. And then, of course, with the pandemic, we had to um, pivot and adjust uh, priorities and resources. Fortunately, we were far enough along in the project that the PUA system uh, that was developed by our vendor, we were able to pivot um, based on the work we had be, been doing to date to, to modernize our entire system. Um, so with regard to what we're seeing with downtime in the system in the conversion days, um, we have been actively in, commu in communication with every claimant. Um, starting about two weeks ago, we started communicating with the entire claimant population, which is about 500,000 claimants. Um, again, you are pulling a single claim. Sometimes an individual has been on four programs during the pandemic. So, of course, that does create some communication challenges. Um, we have found what is to be the most effective communication strategy for us is a global communication to all claimants via email, outbound call campaign. And, of course, I said we'll be um, updating the website. There's a special uh, MyUI Plus resource page at coloradoui.gov. Um, again, and just keeping claimants updated at every step of the way. Um, our hope is that when we bring the system back up this weekend, it will be ready to accept payment requests on Sunday. Every claimant here forward will have a Sunday weekly payment request or certification period. Previously, regular unemployment was requesting their benefits every two weeks. Uh, two weeks PUA was every week. So again, by bringing all of the claims into one system, um, they are operating on the same certification program and within the same environment. Um, I am going to pause there. Uh, my colleague, Phil, did I miss anything on my UI plus? I don't think you missed anything at, at any high level. I do think the other plus is for years, uh, current claimants might have only been told there was some type of issue on their claim, but then they would end up having to contact our call center to try to figure out what specific was holding up on a claim. So the plus side on my UI plus is that it's far more transparent for claimants, that they should be able to see some of those items that might be preventing payment on a claim, and they would receive be receiving some information and the ability to fill out questionnaires to provide us the information we need in a far more timely manner to be able to address those issues. So it should reduce the need for some of those claimants who have confusion trying to understand what's going on with their claim and having to try to contact us first and foremost. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'll just move on just quickly to um, what the, some of the points that Joe covered on implementation of federal extension of benefits. Um, as Joe mentioned, within the PUA program specifically, pandemic unemployment assistance, um, again, has been um, rampant with fraudulent activity. There is a new identity verification requirement within the PUA program. As Joe mentioned, we've only received three out of five required federal guidance documents um, instructing all state labor departments on how to program their systems to administer these benefits. So we don't have much more detail for you on what the identity verification requirement is, but certainly um, Congress realized that there are some deficiencies within that program, and we certainly hope that with additional guardrails in place, um, that will just help us further address the rampant fraud within the program. Um, the one benefit, again, to migrating all claims into one system is that some of the fraud detection and prevention measures that we were able to implement within PUA and actually stop fraud at the front end, we will now have the opportunity to to build those into all regular unemployment claims as well. 
Um, and that speaks to kind of just a quick other point to touch on. We have seen since the CARES Act programs expired, the week ending December 26, we have seen an increase in um, regular unemployment fraud activity. And so um, if you are hearing, and I know some of you have shared with me as recently as yesterday, an increase in your audience, I'm sharing with you that they received a rely -a card or a piece of communication from us. That is likely because a fraudulent claim has been filed within the regular unemployment employment system. Again, likely because they were a victim of one of the larger um, breaches in recent past. Um, and so the, the recommendation that we have these folks is to, um, from coloradoui.gov, we have a very large banner report fraud. Um, on that page, we've outlined five steps that somebody should take if they've received a rely -a card or have received information from their employer that a claim has been filed in their name. Um, and certainly flagging your uh, credit reports with the three credit reporting agencies with a fraud alert. And again, following the steps that we've outlined on the site. Um, so, and we have heard from a number of employers who are receiving requests for information on job separation for employees who still are on their payrolls. And so um, this week we will also be reminding our employer community that this fraudulent activity is, is unfortunately occurring in every state. It's a national issue. Um, and we are be, will be outlining steps that employers can take if they should receive what seems to be a request for layoff or separation information from us and they have had no layoff activity. Um, I will pause just real quick. Let's see, Andy, um, describe what happens if we don't hit the Sunday target. Well, um, you know, with best laid uh, plans, we hope will uh, have us avoiding any issue with bringing the system back up. Let me just say that we are actually bringing over over a million and a half claims when we have these conversion uh, days in the next few days. So it is by no means is it an easy lift. Um, be that as it may, the vendor, uh, the governor's office of information technology and CDLE are all three partners in this effort. And we have done um, significant testing and modeling and um, daily updates, updates with a vendor on the status of the program uh, and the uh, initiative to, to go live. That said, there are always contingency plans. There is a rollback plan. And so we do have, um, you know, alternatives in place. Um, but I think what, what folks need to know, what claimants need to know is they should check our website for updates, check their emails for updates from us. It's really important um, that they do access any information that we're sending them via email, outbound call campaign. Um, but certainly this, uh, our vendor partner and governor's office of uh, information technology, we do have a rollback strategy. Um, so knock on wood, we won't need to deploy that, but we certainly will be communicating with claimants along the way. Uh, the vendor is Deloitte. Let's see, Janet, people can't get in touch. Da -da. Um, right, so, uh, you know, as we've reported um, previously, uh, early on during the pandemic, the existing call center um, workflow that we had in place was not working. We were unfortunately uh, delivering more busy signals or just inability to connect with a person. And so in late summer, we deployed the, um, the Google virtual agent tool to both um, authenticate your claim and get real-time information through the virtual agent or request a callback. Um, the other thing that staff will be working on during our conversion days is actually looking at the pending callback requests, identifying those issues that uh, an agent potentially could work through with a claimant, keeping in mind there will be no access to the claim system. But we certainly want to be utilizing that time to our, the best of our ability to address with um, any, call, any individuals waiting for a callback. Um, that said, we, uh, we take the system down for callback requests and we bring it back up as slots become available. And increasing the availability of slots usually is because we've um, adjusted staffing lev levels. Staff are in training for the new system. We pull them out of training and we put them back on the phones to conduct callbacks. Um, certainly, our big issue right now is focusing on getting uh, real-time support to claimants as we move toward go live. Again, as I mentioned, we'll be adding um, several hundred agents to our third-party call center 
um, to get uh, folks um, real-time help with technical support on their claims. And um, we do believe that there will be a better integration with the new system with the virtual agent tool. So all of these things to say, we know it's difficult when people are waiting for help um, on their claims. Um, we, we are still asking folks to point to some of the self-service options on the website. Um, we have seen a, a pretty large increase in people requesting a callback to report fraud. Again, we understand that a human touch is critical. On the other hand, you don't need to request a callback and wait till January to uh, report fraud. So continue to look at ways we can make process improvements on customer service. Um, the, the other thing I want to, to point out is, and we mentioned this a few weeks ago, we have engaged with a number of um, also third party vendors to help us look at our customer service um, workflows, our processes, our call center, um, and those contracts I think have all been executed and that work is already underway. So it's looking at not only how are we communicating with claimants, making sure the information is clear and easy to understand, but once they get into the system and have an active claim, um, what are some call center customer service improvements we can make to um, provide a better user experience. Okay. Um, so Liz, how widespread is the uh, increase in fraud? I don't really, we don't have any data for you. I will tell you that since the CARES Act expired, as I mentioned, um, what's essentially happened is the criminals are leaving one system and attacking another system. I actually checked in with a national association yesterday of all coordinates all labor department activity, and they confirm that this is happening in every single state. Um, the reality is, as we mentioned, the PUA system, uh, unfortunately, was more susceptible to UI fraud, but what we're seeing now is now that the, the doors are closed on PUA and that system, um, they are taking the stolen identity and they are unfortunately using it to file fraudulent claims um, in the regular unemployment system. As I mentioned, one benefit of this new upgrade that we'll be deploying this weekend is we implemented over 25 fraud indicators within the PUA system. And so we will be using uh, a similar modeling within regular unemployment um, that hopefully will help us address these issues at the front end. The best thing an individual can do if you suspect you're a victim, as I said, is follow the five steps on our website at coloradoui.gov. Immediately, if you receive a rely -a card, call the number on the back of the card and deactivate that. Um, fill out the form and report it to us, and then um, flag with a fraud alert to your credit report with three uh, with the three credit reporting agencies. Um, but again, I think I kind of just touched on Dennis. What you need to do with the rely -a card. Um, we try to be very uh, judicious in how much we share about what the criminals are doing um, in terms of the process when they file a fraudulent claim. Um, I would say that I, I hope none of you on the call were a victim of this. Some of us on the call were. And so it certainly is unsettling. Um, but the, it, you can you can uncover it in a variety of ways. As I said, you receive a rely -a card, you receive a um, request for information from us, your employer receives a request for information. Any of those um, certainly indicate your identity has been stolen at some point in the past and you weren't aware of it. Um, the best thing to do here forward is try and follow the steps to protect uh, yourself um, going forward. Yeah, and Cher, I might jump in just quickly and say that there are individuals out there that might be able to assist us with this fraud issue. So one of the things that we have found here uh, most recently is, and we keep getting these questions, why am I getting all these cards at my house? Why am I getting all these cards at a, a vacant building? We have found that uh, at this point, obviously somebody who's trying to fraud, um, they know those rely cards go out. So what they're trying to do is all this MLS information and listings are available online. So we have found that if you have posted online a rental property, if you have posted your homes for sale an MLS listing, that it is likely that address is going to be utilized for fraudulent claims and to mail all those rely -a cards to. The hope there is that nobody is present there to actually find all those rely -a cards. So if you have people out there with the house for sale and they're not occupying it, or that they have a rental property and they're not occupying it, they may want to be checking that mail 
on a regular basis to see if there are Reliac cards in there so that they can inform us of that so we can get those claims shut down. And I think I'll take another question here was asking about on the hook at tax season. So to claims that we've been able to verify as fraudulent at this point in time, 1099s on those will be suppressed. So those individuals won't receive it and that information will not go to Social Security Administration. We have done what we can, can to the best of our ability to try to ensure those individuals are not being victimized yet a second time by having to also deal with um, the issue with taxes. There will, of course, be a, a number of people that are missed in that group, but that'll be another clue for some people. Unfortunately, that may be the first time that they are aware that they were the victim of identity theft when all of a sudden a 1099 is showing up for some reason, too. That's a good point. Thank you, Phil. Um, let's see. I, I think I've covered fairly extensively what victims should do. Um, I am going to go back to Charles. Oh, no, we're going back to Blair. You guys are active today. Um, okay, so guidance from the US Department of Labor on extension of benefits. Um, I think as Joe indicated, um, because we've already had the FPUC program in place and because that um, seems to be the easiest for easiest for us to program. We do believe that we um, will be rolling out the $300 a week additional benefit to everybody receiving unemployment first. Again, I don't have any timelines for you. I think we reported previously um, late January, early February. Again, just keep in mind because of this modernization, yes, it does um, impede a claimant's ability to get information on their claim for uh, several days. On the other hand, it is uh, likely reducing our reprogramming time in half. Had we stayed in a combination of old and new technology, some of these programs in old technology would not even be possible to program. So um, not only is this modernization reducing our reprogramming time, um, it, which you know is due to the uh, greater agility that we have now with a cloud-based system with all claims in, in one program, um, we're able to, uh, we hope, um, expedite the delivery of those benefits. So I don't have any time frames for you. I will tell you that again, our plan is that the FPUC benefit would be administered first. Um, we should have more to report out on that after go live um, this weekend. Phil, anything to add on that? Yeah, I would say um, anytime Congress extends benefits, they have a tendency to not just keep it simple and make it exactly the same as before. So they make additional changes. So related to the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, the extension of 11 weeks for our state claimants, there are some additional rules and changes related to that and options that they will have provided and that you will still be discussing, which requires a different type of programming than we had before. And there are some additional, as Cher has touched on earlier, some additional rules related to the pandemic unemployment assistance related to to identity verification. Um, there are, is also requirements after a certain point of time to actually provide proof of employment in that system. So these are all items that, that need to be programmed that take different programming than the FPUC. The FPUC literally is just a different dollar amount and for a different period of time, which makes that far quicker to be able to process and roll out and get in place in time. And I think real quick, Cher, I'm going to take Charles's question where he says, to be clear, the people whose claims were interrupted, they don't have to refile correct. This is a bit of a loaded question, Charles, because it's going to depend on what type of claim they are on at this point in time. So if an individual was on PEUC or PUA, both of those programs in their current iterations ended December 26th of 2020 those individuals aren't going to be able to be filing for continued weeks at this point in time because there are no open weeks available on those programs. They will, when the programming is completed, need to refile or reopen their prior claims um, under that new program for PEUC and PUA. There will be opportunities for us, Charles, because I can see somebody off of that question saying, but that could be a number of weeks and I'm not getting paid. That is true. There could be delay there, but there are opportunities for us within that program so that as soon as they go in to refile, that they would have the capability to backdate those claims to be effective December 27th, and which would allow them to start certifying for weeks with on in those claims. 
if an individual moved over was on a regular state unemployment insurance claim, they will not need to refile their claim. So we know there was some confusion, and I saw it today on a couple of other outlets, um, about individuals confused because we told them to file on January 3rd on a state claim. We had a gap uh, with a million moving parts. We forgot to take down a warning that would show up for individuals who were filing a week early on a regular state claim. And so many of those individuals received a warning that their claim would shut down. Um, we still wanted them to go ahead and file January 3rd. What will happen is come January 10th, if everything goes smoothly, they should be able to access their claim and they will be able to file um, their certification request for the week ending January 10th. So if they were on a valid current state claim that has not yet exhausted, they will not have to refile. Individuals on those other programs, will have to refile, but they will need to wait until that programming is completed. But again, Charles and all, we will do what we need to do to make sure we make those individuals whole so that they do not have a gap in payment. Yes, they, they will have a period where they're not be, being paid right now, but we will make sure that they don't have that gap and we make them whole. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order because I think we touched on a number of these. Phil, if you can share your title, that would be great. Um, uh, benefit services branch manager. Thank you. So Tamara, no, actually, um, once everybody is in one new system, IUI plus, when we begin reprogramming for all of the new extensions under the stimulus package, um, for example, if we do roll out FPUC first, all claimants will receive the FPUC because now all, all claimants are in the same system and all of the programming required would, would start at, um, within that same system. So in other words, we believe we will start with FPUC and as such, we believe that all claimants um, that would be receiving the $300 a week, which is everyone, um, regardless PUA or PUC would receive that benefit. But I just wanna emphasize Phil's point. Number one, we haven't given claimants any guidance on whether they need to file a new claim or what the process would be. So it's really important that they do receive, um, when they receive communication from us, they actually do read the emails. We are seeing a little bit of a decrease in the open rates for our email campaigns. Right now it is, it is our primary mechanism to instruct claimants on um, where we are with programming and next steps. So it's really important that they do read um, communication from us. But the plan is once we've instructed PUA or PUC claimants on next steps with a reopen um, or a new claim, then yes, the idea is that all claimants would receive the FPUG benefit at the same time. Um, I think Phil brought up a really good point, and I think I mentioned it before. It's important to know that with the extension of benefits during the CARES Act and where we are now, um, we have seen claimants, a single individual could have been at some point in all four unemployment programs. And so um, you can imagine the complexity in explaining to the claimants eligibility to be in four programs at the point of their uh, of their. Um, unemployment claim life cycle. Um, and added to that is communicating to those folks what's next. So as an example, we had people who two weeks prior to the expiration of the CARES Act on 12-26 were maybe in two programs within a three-week period. So perhaps they had moved from regular unemployment to one of the extended programs um, from PUC to PUA. So um, unfortunately, the systems as they today are not designed to separate systems to um, either clearly communicate to people who may be in one of four programs, um, and certainly to, when we look at reprogramming with the new system, um, think about where that claimant stood at 1226, and now where we need to reconfigure our systems to appropriately move them into one of the new programs. So can't overstate the complexity, and we hope the benefits we'll realize from modernization. Um, just going to go back to, I think Director Barella answered Ed's question. Um, mixed earner unemployment compensation. As of now, we, uh, we do believe Colorado will be a participant in this program. This is, um, again, we have three of five guidance letters. Um, I may defer to fill in where we are with MEUC. Um, this is an example though of a program that had we stayed in our old system, we never would have been able to implement this program. Um, so updating our technology would allow us to be a participant in this. 
And um, this is one of the more complicated ones that, that we are looking at, Phil. Yeah, and, and I believe we did sign on um, to, to um, participate in that one. As Cher noticed, this is, or Cher noted, this is actually the more difficult one to process. So as we talked about, we would be rolling programs out. It is most likely that MEUC may be one of the very last programs that rolls out. There are, are multiple steps that need to occur within that one. It would apply for our regular state benefit claimants, um, but you have to build in certain pieces related to the proof of the gig employment or the self-employment and the dollar amounts there to, to add on. So it will get added, but it will be one of the last ones added, right? PEUC, PUA will roll out before MEUC. I can, I can darn near guarantee it. Um, I think I can take one or two more of these. I thought there was a good one on here from Jacqueline Quinn at CBS, the uh, people who've had their identity stolen heck don't know that their identity has been taken. So how do these people report it? It's a good question, Jacqueline, right? Because if they don't know, they're not reporting it. So that's why I asked earlier, um, if you happen to have a building that you're renting, a facility you're renting, please check your mail every so often. You are helping individuals out by reporting that who have no idea that their identity has been stolen. In addition, Jacqueline, I'm not gonna go into all the specifics, but we don't just rely on individuals to report um, that, that um, their identity has been stolen. We have worked with a vendor. Uh, we continue to work with other vendors and uh, working on creating those fraud holds. Those are based on certain analysis of known fraud claims that then we apply across the board to try to stop these claims as quickly as we can. And then we understand we've caught some innocent people up in those fraud holds during periods of time. So we would ask people to understand we continue to try to refine those processes. They are not perfect um, when we are looking at data related to those. Joe also spoke earlier with this implementation of this new system uh, with PUA and some of the requirements on PUA for identity verification. These create some opportunities that we will look to actually um, put across the entire platform that would include our regular state claims. So the point there, Jacqueline, is what else can we start putting on up front to actually prevent those attempts even being made within our system? Uh, and then if we do that, then we better secure the program for our employers who pay taxes in to support the program and for the federal taxpayers who are all paying for uh, PUA at this point in time. Thank you, Phil. I am going to let you address um, the overpayment question, but I'm going to circle back to you. One was a question on, um, again, try, try to keep it pretty high level in these calls. So certainly if you have individual claimants you'd like me to look to, into, I'm happy to do that. Um, somebody received a PIN early on and never received a benefit payment. Um, and if I understand the, the question correctly, um, a claimant must take their own initiative to request a benefit payment. Unemployment is um, not an entitlement program, so it is only available to those who not only have lost their job through no fault of their own, but are able, available, and actively seeking work. So if somebody filed a claim and never saw a benefit payment, and, and we do advise them about what's required, they must go into the system. Um, here forward after go live it will be every week but previously it was uh, varied depending on the benefit program you were on and request a payment that certification tells the department that you've met those three criteria able available and actively seeking work um, so that we can properly pay those benefits so any more um, questions around the pin issues just shoot me an email I'll try and look into that further um Phil do you want to talk about uh, overpayments so uh, this must be the one from uh, Tsai Shupak. So uh, wondering about the confusing forms in the federal un uh, pandemic unemployment assistance program leading to the overpayments for gig workers essentially and having those overpayments forgiven. Yes, we still went through and in fact, we most recently went through and cleared off another series of overpayments that had occurred as a result of that confusing form at this point in time. So that continued for those, even though a no overpayment notice was not received until December 21st, if we have not yet cleared that overpayment, and that's the reason that overpayment will also be written off time. Um, so again, we, we've tried to clear those and it's, it's possible going further than December 21st, there will still be overpayments that are established on that prior PUA program. Again, if it's for the same reason, we would continue to write those off. 
We're getting close to caught up. Um, the, I, I believe all of the provisions within the new stimulus um, package expire mid-March. Phil, I don't know that I know the week end date off the top of my head. The last date for all the programs, and I'd have to go back and look at the calendar, but the end date for all those programs is March 14th right now. Um, I think if anyone on this, this call does their math, I've done some math ahead, and so there's some rosy projections related to ability to vaccinate Americans. Um, even if you could meet those rosy projections, if you do the math, there are 331 million individuals in the United States. Hitting 70% of those at 20 million a month takes you 11 and a half months. So it is likely at some point in time we will see yet more extensions as we go on, even as we move forward vaccinating people. So I would encourage people to actually get out there and not just listen to individuals telling you, oh, we believe by June X number will be vaccinated, but actually do the math and see what that really means. Um, because doing the math tells you it's gonna be a whole nother full year of peaks and valleys, and we will have other businesses in the meantime, unfortunately, fail, and they will end up with permanent layoffs there. Um, I think you, you bring up a good point, Phil, about what to expect with additional extensions of benefits. Um, during the Great Recession, we had up to 99 weeks of unemployment available in Colorado, um, four tiers of benefits. So again, keep in mind the complexity of reprogramming systems. Um, I, I think there's, you know, this isn't a stimulus check, unfortunately. We have to wait till the bill is signed into law. Then we have to wait till the U.S. Department of Labor issues um, uh, required mandatory guidance. We, we don't know the eligibility requirements for these programs unless we receive those guidance documents. And then once received, um, again, then the work begins to actually go into the system and reprogram. Again, keep in mind that if a single individual at some point could have been on five four or five different programs then, and, and we have you know close to 300,000 people um, with active claims now, that is a lot of um, what ifs that we have to plan for to ensure that um, folks are getting their appropriate benefit amount and they're eligible for that. Um, so we wish, we wish that we could um, simply um, load an update and be able to turn these benefits around. And we're certainly going to work um, as quickly as we can to, to get these benefits to folks who need them. Um, Scott, we did address the issue with PUC and PUA. We believe there will be an additional step required by those claimants, but we don't have guidance on that now, and we'll be communicating to those folks accordingly. And Cher, I can grab the one from Blair here at the bottom, saying Brian usually talks about it. Um, yes, Ryan, the 0% um, interest on federal loans is extended out till March 14th also. Ryan was on, Ryan's on the call, but I'm trying to. And Joe actually answered it already. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Okay, Charles, I skipped over your question. Um, I do not have updated numbers on fraud to date. We certainly, um, we're, we're really heads down trying to focus on, um, again, this upcoming um, upgrade to the system. But um, I will tell you, as I said earlier, and I think I answered Liz's question, that every state saw when the CARES Act expired on 1226, the criminals leaving that system because it was shut down and focusing their efforts on regular unemployment. And I will tell you that we have seen a pretty significant spike in the individuals reporting into us since December 26th that they believe they've been a victim of um, identity theft and fraud. I don't I, have any data to share, Phil. I will follow up a little bit on that question from Liz. So it's not just that we saw criminals targeting the regular state system starting December 6th. We did see an increase in it around that point in time. Actually, there are a lot around December 13th, December 20th. However, as I've discussed earlier, there are multiple things we do related to fraud, known fraud. There's multiple analysis that we go through. So we have seen over the past several months, as we shut certain things down in the PUA system, the ability to file that way, in other words, put holds there, 
all of a sudden very similar behavior would show up a month, month and a half later within our state system. Again, not to a, a as large of an extent as was occurring in PUA, but once uh, those individuals found out they couldn't get in that system, then they would try the state system. Here at the end in December, there, there has been an uptick in claims filed on, on the state system. We're aware of it, and, and those that we can find that, that are suspicious in nature, we are closing down as, you, as we speak to you. We've been closing them down over the last several days, whether that's through some automated processes where we may have made an error on an automated process and then had to go back in and clear another group off for people who are on PEUC. So again, as we try to react to these, because unfortunately in the current state system, there is a lag on how we can get our data and find it, we end up very reactive there in having to um, prevent additional payments from going out on, on those claims. And I think I'll try to adjust Lori Lizarraga's one, which was again asking if we have plans to offer person-to-person -person customer service anytime soon. Again, Lori, I, I think the important thing to remember is we know we're not meeting every customer's need right now. It is a sheer volume issue. Um, we could not possibly hire enough people off the street to be able to handle 100,000 calls coming in on any given day. I don't think anyone could hire that much. Um, but we do continue to look at our processes every day. I have a meeting later today uh, with a vendor who is working on issues related to the call center. And so part of those discussions are on how can we better improve our services to claimants and customers. So does that mean we might need to try to figure out which person actually does need to speak to us today? That's always possible, Lori, but I can't promise anything. I don't know if I need to bring Ryan in to help with Tamara's question on, did we trigger off again on SEB? Sorry to put you on the spot, Ryan or Phil. I was going to say, I saw Ryan's email yesterday only because I had suggested someone reach out to him. So um, I, it's hard to tell right now because uh, the, the federal government still is not necessarily providing us much guidance. But based on numbers that uh, Ryan has seen, we believe that uh, even with the TUR, that it would have been uh, triggered back off. Uh, again, at, at this point, that it would trigger off here January 9th, even if we backdated and we're on the TUR. At some time here in the near future, I would anticipate it's going to trigger back on. Other than that, I'll leave it to the numbers guy, Ryan. Right, yeah. So, uh, Tamara, we're, we're still looking for some guidance from USDOL, um, but if uh, we uh, you know, do use the TUR as an alternate trigger, um, the uh, TUR that we reported on November, uh, for November, uh, on December 18th, that did fall below a 6.5%. And then, again, that's the three month moving average of the seasonally adjusted state unemployment rate. Um, and that would cause the uh, SCB to trigger off then on January 9th. Again, we're looking for uh, verification, clarification. So we'll definitely follow up with you on that. Um, but uh, that does extend it past the November 20, original cutoff of November 28th, so that is positive. Although I would note, Tamara, for individuals who are unemployed directly as a result of COVID-19, after November 28th, they would have been able to file in PUA and receive benefits up until the December 26th date. Could it be? We got through all the questions. I will say if we didn't get to your question, um, I do take a transcript of all the questions submitted and attempt to follow up with you after the call, but certainly let me know if um, we left you hanging and there's anything else that we can be helpful with. I will do one quick kind of pause for folks. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think if, if we're ready to close, nope. Okay, that's Ed. Uh, I'll let Joe take that one from Ed. Um, I just wanted to kind of close with a few housekeeping items. Um, obviously, we will keep you all posted on the progress of, uh, of our um, project over the next few days. Um, we'll be sending out a media advisory, um, updating the website, updates to the department's um, social media channels, and certainly, as I mentioned, um, 
uh, attempting to communicate with claimants. Um, but you know, the, the big message I hope that you can help us convey to claimants is kind of in, in two big areas. Um, these conversion days that we're entering into will, as we've mentioned, um, restrict the ability to get claim information. However, we really hope on the back end, um, the benefits that we realize from the new system um, will we'll far outweigh a few days where we will have this inconvenience, which we do apologize for. Again, we believe the um, conversion and the update will um, reduce the programming time, probably cut in half what we would have seen had we not been at this place. We were hoping that we would have been here in April. Um, time was not on our side, unfortunately, but we're pleased to be there now. Um, ask for um, your patience and also please do communicate with me. Um, if there's something that we can be helpful with, and um, we'll keep you posted as we go along. Um, as far as implementation of the federal benefits, as Joe mentioned, um, we are hoping to point individuals to other resources and support and assistance through these difficult times. We actually just sent an email out last week to all claimants, pointing them to other support services. Um, and assistance, including uh, help through the local workforce center. So we'll continue to do that, but um, we'll be working as quickly as we can after go live um, to then focus and shift our resources on reprogramming to implement the federal extensions. So um, with that, I'm going to, uh, we'll take it offline to help you Ed, if you have any other follow-ups, but I will go ahead and close this out. So um, appreciate your help and, uh, and, and getting the word out to so many people who, who need help right now and we'll be in touch soon. So thanks so much. Have a great day.